Hello, friends. My name is Sarah O'Connell, and I'm the Artistic Director of the Asylum Theater. And it's my honor to welcome you to our theater for a night here at the Clark County Library. You need three things to commit an act of theater. A person committing an action to communicate with a witness in a shared space. Free expression and peaceful assembly are essential to our art form, which is why theater artists play a special role as guardians of the First Amendment. The Asylum Theater's name is our mission statement. We are a haven for artists and their creative ideas. Every book read from tonight has been challenged, banned, or burned in the United States of America in our lifetime. And tonight, we exercise our right to honor them on our stage because, as the beloved author Neil Gaiman said, freedom to write, freedom to read, freedom to own material that you believe is worth defending means you're going to have to stand up for stuff you don't believe is worth defending, even if you find it actively distasteful, because laws are so big, blunt instruments that they do not differentiate between what you like and what you don't. Because prosecutors are humans and bear grudges and fight for re-election. Because one person's obscenity is another person's art. Because if you don't stand up for the stuff you don't like, when they come for the stuff you do like, you've already lost. I'm proud to be here as a theater artist, defending democracy and sharing the humanity that has been left for us in these books. And I'm grateful to all of you for sharing it with me as citizens and other guests here in the theater in the library. We hope that you will take the time to fill out one of the surveys up in the lobby. Uh, there's an economic survey there that proves that the arts like this are a value to the community, just like the books in front of you are. And in order to protect our libraries and the books that are inside of them, we need to prove our worth to the people who don't think so much in terms of humanity, but more in terms of money and finances. So if you could just help us prove that you were here as witnesses tonight to help us make an act of theater, we'd greatly appreciate it. I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank our artists who came together to read to you tonight. And we hope that you will all remember that you are what you eat. So please, eat more art. Thank you.
the substitute motion to direct Dr. Baker to start the removal of the sexually explicit books. Is that, was that the terminology you just used? From our library starting tomorrow and to give us a report by next week to include how many books have been removed so far. Ms. Brooks, I think that's a great motion. I'm not asking for all the books to be removed because knowing the world we live in today, there's probably plenty of books with sexually explicit material in our schools. But I feel like it's a good start. So by next week, we'll have a productive meeting to know how many books were removed thus far and to see how much more we have to go. I think that's a great start, Ms. Brooks, and I appreciate your motion. Now, a short comment to everything. It's not just sexual explicit stuff. There are some bad, evil-related material that we have to be careful of and look at. Thank you, Madam Chair. I agree with that. I think there's not only material that is sexually explicit, there's material that's racially insensitive as well. So I agree with that, to make sure that we rid our library of offensive material. I remember as a kid reading Mark Twain and some of the innuendo that was in there was abhorrent. But we'll deal with that matter later. What we need to do is deal with the pressing issue that came before us tonight. To be honest, I really didn't think it would come to a point where students, the children of this county, would have to come here and speak to the people who are supposed to be representing us. Just because a couple of parents don't want their child to read books with LGBTQ plus content does not mean that they should take that right away from every other student in the county. There are many LGBTQ plus students in our schools, and all students need to be represented through materials and the library and clubs and all school-related activities. Without books with more mature, age-appropriate content, children will never develop viewpoints on their own or learn about topics that interest them. Kids are not their parents, and they should not be forced to have the same opinions that their parents have. Children need the freedom to learn and grow and understand topics that they might not discuss in a home place. And to the parents who are so determined to censor things for their children and are so deeply concerned with what their children are reading at school, have you ever questioned what they're looking up on their phones? Have you ever looked at their search history? Or have you ever seen the things on social media? Because I can guarantee you that the books they're reading are the least of your issues. Taking these books off the shelves also limits the amount of children who are now able to read. These books that would be removed from schools are now only available in public libraries and bookstores, which many are not able to have access to. Because of this, our community will soon turn back to centuries ago, when only the more fortunate would be able to read, and others would be left with nothing. All of us in this room are blessed to live in a country that is built on people speaking freely, and it's something that Americans take a lot of pride in. But why is it only okay to speak freely when it matches a certain person's viewpoint? Why is it only okay when inclusivity is seen as offensive? Please, think about the opinions of the children who are right in front of you.
You have nothing to fear, Wilbur. Nothing to worry about. Maybe you'll live forever. Who knows? And now, go to sleep. For a while, there was no sound. Then Wilbur's voice. What you doing up there, Charlotte? Oh, making something, she said. Making something as usual. Is it something for me, asked Wilbur? No, said Charlotte. It's something for me for a change. Please, what is it? asked Wilbur. I'll tell you in the morning, she said. When the first light comes into the sky, and the sparrows stir, and the crowds rattle their chains, when the rooster crows, and the stars sing, when the early cars whisper along the highways, you'll look up here and I'll show you something. I'll show you my masterpiece. Before she finished the sentence, Wilbur was asleep. She could tell by the sound of his breathing that he was peacefully sleeping, deep in the straw.
They exist. And they are important. Their voices, their voices matter just as much as any other white male's voice that students are forced to read about year after year. My favorite book that I ever read in high school was Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. I had never heard my thoughts so eloquently articulated. I had never seen my perspective as a black woman represented within my school ever, let alone in literature. That was important. I was the only black female in my class, a class where several students had told me that I was their first real black friend, or that I didn't fit the stereotype of what they had they expected black people to be. You know those things. The struggles of one of the greatest poets of all time from her perspective as a black woman. That mattered. By reading her book. They were made aware of their prejudice and they were educated on a perspective that they hadn't seen before. Unless this county wants homogeneity and uniformity, which excludes minorities, we should actively be incorporating diverse perspectives into our schools. <laughs> to be left alone on the tightrope of youthful unknowing is to experience the excruciating beauty of full freedom and the threats of eternal indecision. Few, if any, survive their teens. Most surrender to the vague but murderous pressure of adult conformity. It becomes easier to die and avoid conflict than to maintain a constant battle with superior forces of maturity. Until recently, each generation found it more expedient to plead guilty to the charge of being young and ignorant, easier to the punishment made by the older generation, which itself had confessed to the same crime short years before. The command to grow up at once was more bearable than the faceless horror of wavering purpose, which was youth. The bright hours when the young rebelled against the descending sun had to give way to 24 hour periods called days that were named as well as numbered. The black female is assaulted in her tender years by all these common forces of nature. At the same time, she is caught in the tripartite crossfire of masculine prejudice, white illogical hate, and black lack of power. The fact that the adult American Negro female emerges as a formidable character is often met with amazement, distaste, and even belligerence. It is seldom accepted as an inevitable outcome of struggle won by survivors, and it deserves respect, if not enthusiastic acceptance. I know why the cage bird sings. No. Did you can 
consume any alcohol at the party? She asked. Now, I know that is like law and order. She's trying to discredit me. No, I do not and don't drink. Did Khalil? Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait one second, Mama says. Are y'all putting Khalil and Star on trial or the cop that killed him? Wilkes looks up from his notes. But I, I don't quite understand, Miss Carl. Gomez sputters. You haven't asked my child about that cop yet, Mama says. You keep asking about the little like he's the reason he's dead. Like she said, he didn't pull the trigger on himself. We just want the whole picture, Miss Carl. That's all. 115 killed him, I say. And he wasn't doing anything wrong. He's much bigger than a picture. Do you mean? 15 minutes later, I leave the police station with my mom. Both of us know the same thing. This is going to be some bullshit. <laughs> the hate you give. say in what content consists of. Well, I'm doing it in fact already. I'll admit sometimes I let my son watch YouTube kids videos on my phone. It's terrible, I know. And sometimes I'll look over and say, hey, what the heck are you watching, son? Well, you can't watch that, it's too scary. Or it's too gross. Or, you know what? I don't like SpongeBob SquarePants, right? He freaks me out, be toad. And that's my right as a loving parent who wants the best for his kids. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I'd be derelict in my duty if I didn't do that. However, what I don't do after I exercise my parental veto authority is call up YouTube kids and demand that they take down all the SpongeBob movies. It's my right and my duty to help my kids make the best choices for themselves in accordance with my wife and I's beliefs and values about what will help them become the best people they can be. It is not my right to force those beliefs and values on every other parent and their children simply because how we do things, that is censorship. And it has no place in a public school setting which is expressly designed to consider the viewpoint of all of its students. After defeating the robots, George and Harold untied Captain Underpants. Come on, cried Harold. Let's get out of here. Wait, <laughs> said Captain Underpants. We have to save the world first. <laughs> Captain Underpants, George, and Harold frantically looked all over searching for a way to shut down and stop the inevitable disaster. Hmm, said Harold. I think this might be the lever we're looking for. He pulled the self-destruct lever all with all his might. Suddenly, the Lasermatic 2000 began to sputter and shake. A huge laser beam turned off, and the pieces of the machine began flying in all different kinds of directions. It's going to blow, cried Harold. Run for your lives! Not so fast, said Dr. Diaper, who, who appeared out of nowhere. You demolished my robot, you destroyed my laser matter 2000, and you tried to ruin my one chance to take over the world. But you won't live to tell the tale. Dr. Diaper pulled out his Diaper Matic 2000 ray gun and pointed it at George, Harold, and Doctor, and Captain Underpants. Captain Underpants quickly stretched a pair of underwear and shot at Dr. Diaper. <laughs> the underwear landed right on top of the evil doctor's head. I can't see! I can't see! <laughs> George and Harold ran out of the warehouse as fast as they could. Great shot, Captain Underpants, cried Harold. He 
There are two stories of attempted gang rape that should be considered offensive. such folly. But the men would not walk into him. So the man laid hold on his concubine and brought her forth unto them. And they knew her and ambushed her all the night until the morning. And when the day began to spring, they let her go. Then came the woman in the dawning of the day and fell down at the door of her man's house where the Lord was still, it was light. And her Lord rose up in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way. And behold, the woman, his concubine, was falling down at the door of the house with her hands upon the threshold. He said unto her, Up, and let us be going. But none answered. Then he took her up upon the ass, and the man rose up and gat him onto his place. And when he was to come into his house, he took a knife and laid hold on his concubine and divided her, limb by limb, into twelve pieces, and sent her throughout all the borders of Israel. The book of Judges, chapter 19 verses 23 through 29. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given unto you. The Gospel according to between this lady and this lord. 
So come to the lady. You have been mistook. But the nature of her bias grew in that you would have been contracted to a maid. Nor are you therein by my life deceit, for you are both betrothed to a maid and a man. <laughs> William Shakespeare, both kinds. Retired Lutheran pastor who is opposed to censorship and believes in the separation of church and state. It has been very disappointing to see the board challenged by some conservative Christians who believe that their views on everything from maps to books are the only ones that count. Our schools are not called the Spotsylvania Christian schools for a reason. There are county schools. There are public schools. With one particular viewpoint should never be the only viewpoint. The public school system serves as a community with people of diverse racial, ethnic, religious, political, cultural, and philosophical background. We must empower teachers to open students up to the amazing diversity of our area so they will be prepared to understand all kinds of people and live as productive citizens in our society. We need to give older students more credit for being mature enough to handle the hard truths and make some of their own decisions. Thank you. 
got her period. I'm so jealous, God. I hate myself for being so jealous, but I am. I wish you'd help me just a little. Nancy is sure she's going to get it soon, too. And if I last, I don't know what I'll do. Please, God. I just want to be normal. Are you there, God? It's me, Marvin. <laughs> Topics. Just add more books about Jesus. <laughs> I don't think anybody would object to that. I'm Jewish. <laughs> I have no problem with whatsoever with that. And whether or not you follow his teaching or believe that he was the Son of God, well, there's a lot you can learn from him and just the impact he's made on humanity. Don't close off voices that differ from your own. Welcome them and see what you'll find. I'd also like to point out as a matter of tactics that if there was ever a time and place in human history when censorship was a less effective method of policing our kids' content, it would be America in 2021. Okay? <laughs> I mean, we're all familiar with the little thing called the internet, right? And it's vile spawn social media. Okay, the best way to get a high schooler to hop on a computer and start Googling a topic is to tell them that topic is forbidden. <laughs> Like, 
by educating students will only, well, they think that by educating students like sexually, it's gonna encourage that behavior. Like, no, like studies show that in introducing and educating students about sex, rather than having them try it out and figure it out on their own, greatly reduces what you're trying to prevent. Okay, just because a topic makes you uncomfortable and as a parent or a board member, um, doesn't mean that this isn't reality, okay? To believe that and ignoring these topics and you think that they're gonna make them go away is kind of naive. <laughs> spend much time with girl penguins, and girl penguins didn't spend much time with them. Instead, Roy and Silo wound their necks around each other. Their keeper, Mr. Gramsci, noticed the two penguins and thought to himself, they must be in love. Roy and Silo watched how the other penguins made a home, so they built a nest of stones for themselves. And every night, Roy and Silo slept there together, just like the other penguin couples. And every morning, Roy and Silo woke up together. But one day, Roy and Silo saw the other couple could do something that they did not. The mama penguin would lay an egg. She and papa penguin would take turns keeping the egg warm until finally it would hatch. And then there would be a baby penguin. Roy and Silo had no egg to sit on and keep warm. They had no baby chick to feed and cuddle and love. And their nest was nice, 
But it was a little empty. Well, one day, Roy found something that looked like what the other penguins were hatching and brought it to their nest. It was only a rock, but Silo carefully sat on it and sat. And when Silo got sleepy, he slept, and when Silo was done sleeping and sitting, he swam, and Roy sat. Well, day after day, Silo and Roy sat on the rock, but nothing happened. Well, then Mr. Granzi got an idea. He found an egg that needed to be cared for, and he brought it to Roy and Silo's nest until one day they heard a sound coming from inside their egg. Peep, 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 peep. It said, and Roy and Silo called back, Squawk, squawk! <laughs> peep, peep, answered the egg. Crack! For out came their own very little baby penguin. She had fuzzy white feathers and a funny black ear, <coughs> and now Roy and Silo were fathers. We'll call her Tango, Mr. Granzi decided, because it takes two to make a tango. <laughs> and Roy and Silo taught Tango how to sing for them when she was hungry, and they fed her food from their beaks. They snuggled her in their nest at night, and Tango was the first penguin in the zoo to have two daddies. And Tango makes three. A true story. <laughs> Teenagers are. 
We want instant gratification. We're not going to read 50 pages to learn about porn. <laughs> We're not doing that. We're going to Google it. We're going to look it up. We're not going to read books to learn how to do drugs. We're going to Google how to do drugs. <laughs>
of opinion regarding religion. The separation of church and state is one of the fundamental elements of our democracy. No governing body should make decisions on the basis of their personal religion. Any attempt to censor that, no matter how small, is contagious, and it leads to much worse. Will you allow this to happen, or will you draw that line in the sand? to metaphors of mild physical pain as I tried to articulate why I want to do pronouns. Female pronouns didn't bother me when I was younger, but now they do. I know switching isn't try. Getting called she feels like discovering a rock stuck in my shoe or getting scratched by the tag at the back of my shirt. A small spike of soluble discomfort. Where are the scissors? Ashley and I were invited to sign at a publisher's booth at Comic Con for the first time. You ladies are missing your name tags. I I'll get them for you. Oh no. I didn't tell them about my pronouns. Here you go. Say something, say something, um, thank you. And then it happened again. It, do you ladies need anything? No, thank you. So why did I say something the first time? It happened the third time. Make a comic about it. Gender. Masks, social distancing, LGBTQ, RT, 
sexuality or sex. The main point here is fear. Many students, many parents fear progress and change. Society is changing and your child is growing up. Dangers of our children are found in a library, but and it's not also it's not found in the content of the book or any book, but outside of our schools. It's been suggested that simply banning these offensive books is not enough. They have said that they should also be burned. Now this takes the conversation to an entirely different level. Um, Englishmen 
upon a Negro woman should be slaves or free. Be therefore enacted and declared by the present Grand Assembly that all children born in this country should be held bond or free only according to the condition of the mother. Enslaved black women gave birth to enslavable children, even if the fathers were white. In disregarding English legal tradition, the colonists adopted the Roman principle of partis sequitur ventum. The offspring follows the belly. Used to determine the ownership of animals. The law allowed white men to profit from their sexual assaults on black women, freed from the worry of their mixed race. Offspring had any legal claim to freedom. White men could rape enslaved women with total impunity maintaining their domination while increasing their wealth. Their control over black women's bodies was key to creating a permanent labor supply. The law also helped to invent the meaning of race. Although they clearly determined the status of black women's children for political and economic reasons, the Virginia legislators pretended slave status was a natural identity passed down through procreation. They constructed a racial classification scheme, but made it seem like an inherited condition. Though they imposed slavery by power, they cast black women's womb as the producer of their child's subjugated condition. 1619 Dear readers, no. Dear audience members, you're probably wondering what this stories, fairy tales, fantasies about heroes and monsters, or sleepy stories about funny talking times way before any of you were born. You've probably read several nonfiction books too, books about the solar system, cool animals like wolverines, and historical events such as the Revolutionary War. Biographies of trailblazers like Harriet Tubman, Rosa Parks, or Martin Luther King Jr. And when you've read books about people and events from the past, you may have thought, well, what does this have to do with my life today? Well, this book includes the past and is directly connected to our lives as we live them right in this moment. As you read this book, you'll come across lots of people. You may already know about some of them, but this book may make you think about them in a whole new way. In fact, you may even look at your own life differently. See, this is a present book. No, not like a birthday present book, but like an everyday present book. Or maybe just an everyday book. A book about the here and now. A book that can help you understand, for example, what the Black Lives Matter movement today is all about. A book that can help you better understand where we are in this moment as Americans and how we got here, especially when it comes to race. Uh-oh. R word. <laughs> now, you may have been told not to talk about race. Or may have been made to feel like you can't, as if, as if it's some kind of bad word. But it's not, and it shouldn't be. It can't. B. So let's all just take a deep breath. Inhale. Hold it. Exhale and breathe out race. 
Okay, I understand up until this point there hasn't been audience participation, <laughs> but this is the one time we actually wanted. So we're gonna try that again, okay? All right, so let's all say it up. So, take a deep breath in, hold it, exhale, and breathe out, grace. grace. <laughs> wasn't so bad, was it? Now we'll continue to take time to pause, to breathe and feel, and unpause as you read, think, and talk about race. Besides talking about race is one of the most important skills you can learn. Think about the coolest thing you can do. Being able to talk about race is that, times two. And three times as important, and here's why. Until we learn to talk about race, the poison of racism won't go away. And as you read and think about race, also think about rope. Sometimes rope can be a lifeline. It helps climbers safely move upward and protects them from falling. Sometimes rope can be a weapon. It can be used to control and cause harm. Rope can also join people together in powerful ways, like jumping double dutch brings you all your friends together in the summer. Or like a swing connected to a place that, or the branch of a tree that takes you sky high. Rope can be used to tie, pull, hold, and lift. So how do people become tied to racist and anti-racist ideas? Who are people pulling at each end? How do racist ideas hold people down and how do anti-racist ideas lift people up? How do things get so tangled in the first place? And well, who are the people working to unravel this mess? As you hold on to the image of rope, also keep three words in mind. Three words to describe the people that we'll be exploring and ideas that they're tied to. Segregationism, assimilationism, anti-racism. There are serious definitions to these, but I'm gonna give you the one for the book. Segregationists are haters, like real haters. Okay? People who hate you for not being like them. Assimilationists are people who like you only if you act like them. And then there are anti-racists. They love you because you're you. These aren't just words we'll be using to describe the people in this, in this book. Remember, this is more than just a past book. It is a present book. It is an everyday book. So these are the words that we'll be using to describe who you and me and all of us are every day. Along the way, you'll notice that people aren't just one way. They can believe in and express any one of these three ideas, sometimes all in the same sentence. And most important, people can change. I'm gonna repeat that loudly in the back for those of you who are sitting in back there. People can change! <laughs> Since the beginning of the United States of America, there have been different ideas about what freedom means and who freedom is for. Those different ideas have always been connected to race, and this book is meant to take you on a race journey from then to now. With some people you may have think of as new heroes, anti-racists who see ourselves, who love you because you are you. One last thing. Some thing you'll see in this book is that all stories have points of views. And in these pages, you'll hear the author's voice taking you on this journey. But the author wants to be clear. This is not a book of their opinions. This is a book about America and about you. This book is full of truth. It is packed with absolutely true facts about the choices people made over hundreds of years to get us to where we are today. The choices people are still making. So remember, as you read, that you are part of writing the next chapter. The choices you make, the words you use, the way you look at yourself and those around you, they all matter. You matter. And I hope that you believe the world can be good.
that things can change. And that knowing this history can help us move forward towards a better, more honest future every day. Stand for kids. should and should not be displayed will psychologically harm our kids. Providing books with captivating storylines and positive resolutions to horrible situations is essential to any kid facing overwhelming circumstances. Knowledge is power. Knowing about the world around them, the people in that world, is not dangerous. It is power.
It's a constitutional right. So I continue and I tell the children that if a parent or group of citizens is very concerned about the contents of a book, they can always come to me and we can talk about it like rational, calm adults. Remember kids, that in this library, we read without limits and we embrace everyone's right to read. But who has the right to say so who can let you read? That's right, your parents, they get that right. <laughs> but remember, your values and your rules and expectations in your family must guide you as you freely choose what you want to read. No one, no one but your parents or guardians can tell you what you can and cannot read at the end of these lessons. You know, I promised my students the ones that I care so much about, that I will defend their rights and I will stand between them and those who seek to ignore this right, or worse yet, destroy it. So here I am fulfilling that promise. You must honor that policy that protects students' right to choose what they want to read. It is not debatable. It is not an option. It is our truth. The First Amendment gives Americans five basic freedoms. The freedom of speech. The freedom of the press. The freedom to assemble. The freedom to petition. The freedom of or from religion. We, we all are all free to read. read. 